All right, good morning, everyone. I think we should get started. So it's a really great pleasure to see all of you here. And thanks very much for coming. And uh, so seeing where uh, our ADS CFT group moved to here in Würzburg. And uh, there will be a couple of official welcoming addresses later. So I think now we should just get started. And uh, so we're very happy as our first speaker to have Kunrad Schalm from Leiden. And so he's going to bring holography to the laboratory. So enjoy the conference. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, good morning. First of all, thank you very much, uh, Johanna, and all the organizers for uh, organizing another conference on gauge gravity duality. So as all of you know, when gauge gravity duality or holography well, uh, came to the scene about 20 years ago, this was really a new road to an old dream. And the idea was really to try to apply string theory to explain real life physics experiments. At heart, we're all physicists, and this is what we are here to do. Now, of course, instantaneously after this happened, people already tried to apply it to QCD, the most natural cousin of ADS5 CFT4. And a couple of years afterwards, people realized that perhaps the many body realization of QCD in RIC was a more natural arena to apply this. And it's slightly less sensitive to the details and slightly more, uh, more uh, susceptible to the generic collective behavior. And about ten year, uh, three years after that came the revolution of ADS-CMT. And what I'm going to tell you about a little bit today is, is how especially this last aspect has really blossomed uh, also experimentally in the last few years, and there's a real chance to maybe realize this dream. So why is ADS CFT, why, why is it important perhaps to condense matter systems? Well, there are two main reasons. One is that it's a generating functional for new non-trivial uh, unknown infrared fixed points. It turns out that if you apply ADS CFT to sort of uh, several uh, starting points in UV, you deform it by an relevant operator, you can get infrared fixed points that we weren't able to get before using ordinary quantum field theory techniques. And this is one of the main breakthroughs. And the other is a slightly more technical aspect, but it is incredibly useful. It turns out that ADS-CFT allows you to co compute real-time response functions at finite temperature and finite density with relative ease compared to the normal framework. And this makes it very easy to quickly check various theories and, and um, work out the responses that you see in experiments. And sometimes, even in particular theories where you have no quasi-particles in the infrared at all, and there's no continuous adiabatic connection to a perturbative quantum field theory regime, it may be the only way you can compute these response functions. So these are really the main aspects of the story. And the important part, the important context for condensed matter is theories where you have so-called, the physics is controlled by a quantum critical point. And a quantum critical point is a specific case where if you have a finite temperature phase transition, and by changing one of the parameters of the theory, you push the phase transition to zero temperature. And at zero temperature, the nature of the phase transition can change. You can have different critical exponents. But the whole philosophy is particularly if this is a second order phase transition, that there's a universe first behavior here still holds. But it becomes even more powerful precisely because it is a zero temperature phase transition. Because as all of us know, if you take a zero temperature critical theory and you put it at finite temperature, it doesn't break the scaling invariance, but in fact it inherits some of the scaling invariance in its finite temperature response functions. And so you get a whole region, the quantum critical region, where you can find responses that are governed by the universal critical behavior at this critical point. And this is really uh, allows you sort of an experimental range to try to test some of these ideas. And this is not just an idea. You can really do this in experiment. This is a famous one that many people quote of the resistance um, uh, in a heavy fermion system as a function of the magnetic field. And you see here the scaling of the resistance as a function of the temperature. And in these blue windows, you have a sort of an ordinary metallic response where the resistivity scales as the temperature squared. And then here you see this very characteristic fan emanating from a quantum critical point, which people believe is here at the lowest temperatures the experiment is not able to probe. But you really see this characteristic behavior where the response function changes its scaling as a function of the temperature to become linear in the temperature. And these are the, these are the, the type of systems 
where really ADS CFT may have something to say. And the real system we have in mind, the one that uh, most of the condensed matter community wants to know, is the strange metallic region as it appears in high TC superconductors or heavy fermion systems. This is called a strange metal in the same way that the string theory community or general relativity calls things a black hole. This is the big unknown. And that is what we want to find out how to understand it. And you can already see it a little bit from this phase diagram that there is this characteristic wedge and there's a notion, there are suggestions that this, this strange metallic region is precisely one of these finite temperature regions that are controlled by a quantum critical point at zero temperature. So that is, that is real hope and a lot of the uh, experiments that I will show you today are precisely about this strange metallic region in high TC superconductors that um, have been recently reprobed since, uh, um, of course, many experiments were done right after the high TC cuprates came about, but they've been revisited in many years and that is uh, very interesting. But before you revisit, you want to know what is it that you want to find? What is the theory? What should the theory of a strange metal explain? Well, one of the most prominent features is that the resistivity, just as in this example of a heavy fermion system, should scale linearly with the temperature. This is characteristically different from an ordinary metal. In an ordinary metal, the resistivity scales at the temperature squared. And here are some of the data, early data, right after high TC superconductors were uh, discovered, that shows you that it's a remarkable linear rise that this is uh, the temperature in degrees Kelvin that extends over an enormous range, okay? So normally you would expect this quantum critical wedge at some finite temperature to cease to exist. This is where the, the secretly you start probing the electronic structure at microscopic scales. But here you really see this persists to an enormous, over an enormous scale uh, of temperatures. And it is very, very linear. It's a beautiful uh, signal of the strangeness of this metal. A second thing is, a characteristic one is there's a power law in the AC conductivity. If you measure the conductivity, the inverse of the resistivity, as a function of the frequency of the applied field, you put in an oscillating magnetic field, there's a regime at intermediate frequencies where it, gives, it has a very characteristic scaling law to the omega two-thirds. This is also very different from ordinary metals. In ordinary metals, you have a characteristic, what's called a Drude peak response, which basically characterizes how the total charge density slowly degrades due to momentum relaxation. Then there's a, a gap. There's no excited, or there's, there's a very uh, depletion of excited states in the system. And then you have the interband transitions between various uh, higher excited electronic states. And so in the intermediate regime, it's very constant rather than this characteristic scaling. A third feature is what's called the Hall angle versus DC conductivity scaling. The whole angle is just the ratio of the whole conductivity versus the longitudinal conductivity. And this scales as one over T squared, whereas in ordinary metals, it should scale the same way as the conductivity. And if the conductivity scales as T, this should scale as T in this case. And this is very strange, and it's an example of some other features that you see in this, what's called an inverse Matheson law. The only way, as I'll explain in a moment, you can reasonably try to put these two features together is if you, if you have what's called an inverse Matheson law, or in other words, conductivities add rather than resistivities add. I will come back to this in a second more, but there are also lots of other power law scaling that is measured in response functions. And if you put these two together, then this is sort of the list of data that you have to explain in a strange metal. It's not an exhaustive list. There are other features, but these are sort of the four main things that you want to show. So let me come back about the importance of the whole angle because the linear resistivity or this critical scaling phenomenon comes sort of naturally with the quantum critical point. If you assume that there's a quantum critical point that controls the strange metallic regime. But this is not necessarily follows that. Now what happens if you look at this whole angle in these strange metals? As I mentioned, the regular conductivity scales as inverse temperature, but the whole angle, the ratio of the whole conductivity to the longitudinal activity scales as the temperature squared. If you compute these quantities using textbook uh, condensed matter theory, uh, where there's sort of a single relaxation time that controls all uh, the long time transport in the system, you find that both the conductivity and the whole angle should scale in the with the same power of this relaxation time in the system. 
And so if, if this relaxation time depends linearly or quadratically on the temperature, it doesn't matter, both these objects should scale the same way. So this is a really fundamental puzzle which is separate from the aspect that you need a quantum critical system with scaling phenomena. And this is why people say you need an inverse Matheson law, you need sort of two ways of independent ways of degrading the system because if you're in an ordinary metal where resistivities add, this is a statement that there's one degree of freedom that's responsible for all the transport. There may be different ways that it degrades, but it can scatter first of an impurity, then it can scatter off the lattice, then it can scatter off something else. But if there's a single degree of freedom, you always have that resistivity add. It's like having them in series. The only way you can explain this is if you have a system in parallel. There must be two independent sort of degrees of freedom, and they independently, one is sort of sensitive to whole angle physics and the other to longitudinal physics. It's the only way this can come about. And this is an, an, a very important aspect of strange metallic physics. So the key insight from holography that I'm going to explain to you about is that this precisely these features come out of the sort of fair, even the simplest models of holography that you try to build for these systems. It's the idea that strange metal is a state of matter which consists of two sectors, remember this whole angle, and one of it is a quantum critical state that gives you the power law scaling in the system. And this uh, immediately gives you, at a qualitative level, precisely the responses or the theory that you want. You have two simultaneously coexisting linearly independent sets of low energy degrees of freedom, so you have automatically have these two li lifetimes, and that gives you as built in, this anti matheson rule for transport, it also gives you something else. Because you have two sectors, your phase space at low energies is significantly larger, so all line widths of responses in, in your system should be broadened. This is something you can tell your experimental colleagues to look for. The second thing is that you have this quantum critical state, that was sort of part of the original hypothesis in the story, and this really, uh, what, what comes out of holography is that it really is one of these strongly entangled uh, scaling invariants. In particular, it looks like it's a charge conjugation symmetric hyperscaling invariant critical theory. Now, the fact that it's a critical state means you have to deal with systems without particles. There's no characteristic scale. The responses are, are set by the intrinsic physics of the home. There's lots of scaling behavior. And in particular, there's universality in this system. And so this gives you a hope, because it's universal, that you can apply this to indeed many si different systems, many different high TC superconductors and strange metals. Now, if this were the whole story, your condensed matter colleague to go, oh, okay, well, once I've learned this, I can apply my ordinary condensed matter tools and try to explain it. And indeed, some of these ideas have indeed been explored in the condensed matter literature, particularly this anti matheson rule for DC transport. It's so glaring at you, you can find several papers in the literature that have tried to do it. One of the key features, though, that, so, that is new from holography is the idea that one of these sectors should be the quantum critical state. And this just gives you an, uh, the other aspect of holography which is very important, because if you want to compute the response functions, particular of the quantum critical sector, and the interplay between these two sectors, this is very hard to do. It's not impossible, but it's very hard to do with ordinary tools. And so there's a, there's a very large role remaining for holography to simply be the theoretical framework in which you can answer some of these questions. And this is the main part of my story, both the, that the holography gives you the insight that it should be this dual state, and it gives you the computational framework to compute these things. And so here is a very simple example of how it explains this fundamental puzzle in a combination of things. If indeed I have two sectors, a Lifshitz scaling quantum critical sector plus some other rather more normal state, then you automatic, if they both survive at low energy, I automatically have this anti matheson rule. Now if on top of it, this critical sector, right, happens to be charge conjugation invariant, charge conjugation invariant systems have a very special property that if you disturb them, if you put in a constant electric field on them, then uh, you can create holes and particle pairs out of the vacuum that create a current for you, but because the holes move one way and the particles move the other way and they are precisely balanced at the 
uh, charge conjugation invariant point, there's no net momentum flow in the system. And so in these systems, you can have charge flow without momentum flow. And so that means that they are sensitive. They are, in particular, they're not so sensitive to the way the momentum is degraded in the system. However, if I now put in a transverse magnetic field in this system, both the holes will move uh, anti-clockwise and the particles will move clockwise in this system. And now they both move in the same direction. So now the total, there is a net momentum current in the system. And now this will be sensitive to the way momentum is degraded in the system. So by combining these two features, you can indeed find systems where precisely you can get this two lifetimes, but not only go this two lifetimes, because of the charge conjugation invariant property, they really scale with two different relaxation times in the system. So this is a way how you can resolve one of these puzzles that you see in experiment. So <clears throat> these are the, is the main message of my story. So what, what, what are these unknown non-trivial interact points? Well, as many of you know, you take an ADS black hole, you study it at finite temperature or finite density, and uh, in particular, what you do is you want to not study pure ADS, you want to some way or another trigger an infrared flow to a non-trivial fixed point. And this is very similar to what happens in condensed matter physics. In condensed matter physics, you start with the Schrodinger equation, governing all the electrons circulating the nuclei of your atoms in the lattice. But that's, of course, not what you study. You simplify this some way or another and try to find out what happens at low energies. In the same way here, we start with some relativistic, perhaps supersymmetric CFT, but then by deforming it, that is when we arrive at sort of these non, new non-trivial infrared points. And as many of you know, sort of generically, they're captured by these very simple models where you have a gauge field whose uh, <coughs> value of the vector, time-like component of the vector potential gives you the chemical potential in the theory, a stress tensor to govern the energy physics, and then at one or a few more scalar fields and or fermion degrees of freedom necessary to trigger the infrared flow and capture some of the degrees of freedom that remain in the infrared. And generically, what you find in these systems are that in the infrared, the, the metric uh, that you uh, <coughs> looks like this. this uh, and this has this characteristic feature that as you scale time and x, there is a scaling invariance in the system, but it has a non-trivial dynamical critical exponent z, which can be anything. And in particular, the charge sector sometimes can also have a non-trivial dynamical critical exponent. And these are these Lifshitz quantum critical theory due to the non-isotropic scaling between time and space, so am I supported by an ordered state or supported by this infrared flow to the uh, non-trivial ground state that you want to see. The hyperscaling violation refers to the fact that if you compute the entropy density in the system, there is a change with the naive dimensional scaling in the system by some parameter theta, which you re are reflected here in the metric. So the entropy density doesn't scale as its naive dimensionality, even though you have a critical state uh, in the system. Now, the immediate thing that you get from this is because you have this scaling symmetry, you have this quantum critical sector. So lots of responses will be governed by power law scaling responses, exactly like you see in experiment. And the second thing is because you have this critical theory which is often supported, in most cases supported by a more ordinary sector, a holographic superconductor, a fermion condensate, other things, ne more neutral condensates. You have multiple degrees of freedom, at least two that survive at low energies, and so you automatically get these uh, inverse Matheson law responses where two conductivities add in the system. So this is the framework. This is just very simple generic. It's sort of like a, a more fancy version of Landau-Ginsburg effective type theories can give you a lot of the responses that you see in experiment. And so now it's a challenge. Once we have this theoretical framework, it's really the challenge to experiment. Is this really what we see? And can we make sense out of the numbers more than just the qualitative feature? And so one of the reasons uh, Johanna invited me to, uh, to give you this talk is that uh, a year and a half ago, a group of us, or mostly a group of experimentalists, where we as theorists act as support, has gotten a grant from the Dutch government to really try to explore these features in 
high TC group rates. And uh, I should mention one extra person, especially who at Leiden has been helping us tremendously, Sasha Krikun, he's here in the audience. And uh, with these people, we are now trying to actually do this, uh, <coughs> do this test of whether holographic responses are really measured in these strange metal things. Now, what was the driving force? Why now? Why uh, is now the moment to try to see what is going on? Well, remember one of the early successes of ADS-CMT, which was the computation of the single fermion response function. If you look at a generic single fermion response function, if there's a Fermi surface in your system, then it should roughly respond like this. There's a linear dispersion relation around the Fermi surface, and there's a characteristic self-energy in the system. And one of the beautiful successes that came out of these early days is that you can compute this self-energy exactly, and it has a very unconventional form. In fact, it's an arbitrary uh, monomial in the frequency of the response. The exponent of this power of the frequency is a free parameter in the system. You can tune it depending on your system. And, but however, the response, as you would see it, if you would plot the Fermi surface peak that you find, is very different qualitatively depending on whether this exponent is less than one half, one half exactly, or more than one half. If it's more than one half, then it looks very similar to an ordinary Fermi liquid, or in other words, the theory of an ordinary metal. Um, if you have uh, an exponent which is precisely one half, then this power is precisely equal to the frequency of the linear dispersion relation. You have a balance. This is called a marginal Fermi liquid. This has a special status in the community of strange metals because this is a phenomenological theory where people just put in a self-energy that's scaled like this for these strange metallic regions. And holography was really, really one of the first theoretical frameworks where this phenomenological theory came about. More drastic happens when this exponent is less than one half, then you really have a non-Fermi liquid. In this case, the, in particular, the imaginary part of the self-energy dominates at low frequencies. The lifetime of this particle is shorter than its one frequency cycle. So this is not really a particle-like response at all. It's just some, in your response function, you see a local peak, which is very, very broad and short-lived. Now, uh, as I said before, this new can have, that really means that you have a system without quasi-particles. And as been, has been explained in the literature, the one way you can really understand the system, this is really a local fermionic probe of your system that interacts with this quantum critical infrared in this system. So in this response function, you already immediately see the fact that you have these, this extra sector in, uh, at low energies that survives. And in particular, this also means a very important thing. Because this extra sector is present, you sort of, this is an indirectly a signal of this anti-Matthesian physics that is going on. Because in normal metals, it's precisely the quasi-particles around the Fermi surface that are that single degree of freedom that survives at low energies that carries all your transport in your system. But if there is this quantum critical sector, this must mean that transport cannot follow from the Fermi surface excitations, a fancy word for the electrons alone, measure in experiment. So you can measure these fermion response functions with a technique called ARPES, Angle Resolved Photo Emission Spectroscopy. It's a fancy version of just a photoelectric effect where you can resolve the response function by frequency and momentum. So you can literally generate these plots. This is the frequency plane, and this is the momentum plane. And as, if you hit precisely the resonance, if you have precisely the energy where you have an uh, electron in your system, just like in the photoelectric effect, that's when you see the response. And one of the interesting things is that, although this was, of course, measured in the early days of high TC superconductivity as well, there's been a revolution sort of in ARPES that where the intensity or the sensitivity has increased tremendously. And about two years ago, this group in Boulder revisited the strange metallic region in high TC superconductors with this experiment. And they precisely looked at the line widths, the decay rate, the imaginary part of the self-energy of the system. And here's some of the data on an overdoped, an optimally doped, and two underdoped sam samples of a high TC superconductor. Now, as you can see, the data is reasonably good. You can, you can extract the behavior of the self-energy as a function of the frequency in the system. And what do you get? Well, 
they were not aware of the holographic prediction, and the only way they could model their data was by postulating some power law response with a power they called alpha, which happened to be exactly the same nu kf as was proposed in holography. So let me emphasize again, they had, were unaware of these results several years earlier in holography, and this is what they found. This exponent alpha, as a function of doping, changes. It precisely goes to nu is one half, this marginal Fermi liquid, at optimal doping level. Below optimal doping, it's a little less than one half, and above optimal doping, it's a little higher than that. This is really spectacular. If this holds up, if other experiments can verify this, this would really show that holography is the context in which you have to understand these strange metals, because there's no other theoretical framework where we can understand that you have this um, scaling exponent which can sort of change on the external parameters. There's a second thing from a more broader theoretical point of view that should immediately strike you. Remember, the strange metal was supposed to be a quantum critical finite temperature region over a quantum critical point at zero temperature. All the behavior here should have been inherited from the single point here. But in critical theories, right, the whole point of critical theories is that the exponents are universal. They don't change other aspects here. But here I have a theory where the exponents change. So the only way to make sense out of this is that there isn't really a quantum critical point, but there's actually a line of critical points at zero temperature that some way or other extends this. Now this may seem very remarkable and a very drastic conclusion to base on one experiment. However, there is another set of experiments where people very carefully measured the resistivity. Remember, this resistivity had this characteristic linear behavior scaling with the temperature in this quantum critical wedge. And what they showed by very carefully looking at the low temperature response, they found that this linear, or there's a component of the resistivity that scales linear in the temperature that extends all the way to low temperature, but at a sequence of points as well. So there's supporting evidence for this idea that a strange metal is even more interesting than you would have thought. It's not controlled by a quantum critical point, but it may be controlled by a line of quantum critical points in the infrared. Okay. And so this is what, what, what triggered our uh, community to get together and try to respond to this. And our experimental colleagues have been working very hard. This is fresh off the press data from a week ago where they've, tried, where they've measured precisely again the imaginary part of the self-energy in the system. And now comes the interesting part. Of course, what you measure is far more than you want to know. There's all kinds of aspects in the story. In particular, if there are other contributions, uh, such as phonons or uh, other uh, uh, lattice umklop effects to the self-energy, you have to take this into account. And it gets far more interesting than that, because if you add conductivities like this, you're secretly thinking again of a sort of Matthiessen rule in the story. Whereas if they are independent of each other, you have to think again about it. So it could be there's much more information in this response than I... As I said, this is fresh of the press, unanalyzed yet, so uh, we hope to report on a more detailed analysis to you in the future. However, you can even tell your experiments with friends much more. If this really holds up, there are two immediate consequences that you can ask, try to see an experiment. One is, of course, as was immediately realized by uh, the MIT group, who beautifully related this to the near ADS2 responses in these, lift, in these um, uh, holographic strange metals, is that if you're away from the Fermi surface, but you look near zero frequency, you should, have, you should measure the ADS2 near horizon response directly. You should also see these scaling exponents uh, in the response function right there as precisely zero frequency, the value of the, uh, of the, imagine, of the spectral function should be exactly zero, and then it should uh, scale away from it with a very characteristic power that measures this infrared directly. This is probably hard to measure because you're trying to measure some number close to zero, but if you can see this, again, this would be a, an absolute signal of the physics that is predicted by holography that's going on. Another aspect is that in real life, these fermion response functions sit in a lattice of atoms, and so there are periodicity effects in the system and that also means that these various characteristic scaling exponents of the self-energy can mix 
due to various umklop effects. And that means indeed that in various balloon zones, you can have different responses in the system. And even though you can get a Green's function which is completely consistent with the symmetries, actually it turns out it's strictly not periodic. There are two ways the Green's function could have responded to the periodicity in the lattice. It could have summed over lattice images in the exponent, but it turns out it sums over lattice images in the response. This is again one of these things that comes out of holography that is completely consistent, but it's not what you expected, and you can try to measure this in experiment. Now, uh, <coughs> one of the other things you can do, it's all about high TC superconductors, you can try to study the descent into superconductivity. This was done already directly after the first fermion response functions were computed, and one of the interesting things that these people found in 2009 is that uh, if you look at the di what's called the dynamics of the gap, the dependence of the gap that opens up in the fermion response uh, as a function of the temperature, that this appears to be independent of the temperature. What happens as the temperature increases, the gap just fills in, but the location of the peaks of the gap stays the same. This is very different from what happens in ordinary superconductors. In ordinary superconductors, right, uh, what a superconductivity is just a spontaneous breaking of the U1 symmetry, the fermion response functions due to that get a mass, uh, that's the gap that you measure here, but this mass is directly dependent on the temperature in the system. Oh, um, let me just say, here is, a, here is an even better picture where you can really see that the peaks of this gap stay at the same position independent of the temperature in the system. So what happens in ordinary superconductors is actually that it's this gap that narrows as you approach the critical temperature whereas the width of the peak roughly stays the same. Here, you've, the, what, what is sh show, follows from this holographic computation is precisely the other thing. The gap seems to fill in, in other words, it's the width that increases, whereas the, si the, the location of the peaks stays roughly constant. What you should see in experiment is a response that's so roughly like this. And also about two years ago, this was revisited in two experiments. Here is a, a Japanese group that gave exactly this picture here. Here you see the gap supposedly closing. Here you see this, the self-energies, and this is TC. And as you see, the gap has barely changed before you hit TC. At the same time, this same group who measured the uh, RPES data also measured the response functions in the superconducting region. And here at optimally doping, you beautifully see how as the temperature increases, this point stays the same, but the gap just fills in rather than that uh, the, uh, it closes as a function of the temperature. So again, here's something that sort of rolled out of holography, and you can see this actually in experiment. And here's a, there's an update on these results uh, rather recently as a, from the beginning of this year. So this, is one of, this was one of the main drivers for us to get in contact with our experimental colleagues and say we should revisit this and do this. There's another uh, important reason why we are driven to this, and that's to come back to this um, characteristic feature of the strange metals, the universal linear relativity. Now, in ordinary metals, what happens is that momentum relaxes long before the collective behavior sets in. If you have two electrons, the mean free path between electrons in a metal is actually very, very long compared to the lattice size. What that means is that electrons, they actually scatter off the lattice of the local potential field generated by the nuclei or of impurities in the system long before they know there is another electron. And so this is really sort of a single particle physics exercise on how the momentum right, uh, of this electron uh, relaxes due to its exchanges with its environment. And it's this momentum relaxation that precisely controls the resistivity at very, very low temperatures, including uh, or at low frequencies and low temperatures. However, you could conceive of a different story. You could conceive that you have a system which has very strong correlations, very uh, short mean free path. In fact, if you have a system with no quasi-particles at all, in some way or another, the mean free path should be infinitely short. And then you can have a very different way uh, that the system responds to momentum relaxation in the system. In that case, the system knows about the other constituents long before it knows about the lattice length or the impurity of the scaling. 
And that means the system collectivizes. And there's a beautiful universal theory of collective physics called hydrodynamics. And that means that you should start, the way you should study the system is you should study some kind of fluid-like behavior that is sloshing around in this lattice with impurities. And that means that momentum relaxation uh, sets in after collective behavior. And so the relaxation time that controls all these conductivities and the response functions is now not set by microscopic physics, but by these macroscopic responses. Now you can actually make this rather precise. If I have a system, let's say I have a system where the, the momentum is predominantly degraded by impurities, then uh, there is a universal way, you can open a condensed matter textbook, that you can compute the DC uh, resistivity in this system. You need to know the two-point function of these impurities and its imaginary part, sum over all the different length scales at which they appear, and take the zero frequency limit. Now, the, the big puzzle always in this is what is for the choice for impurity operator do you take? One of the ideas that we had is that since you're studying a hydrodynamic theory, which should be in, in the same way as a Wilsonian effective theory, a theory where you have some universal set of low energy degrees of freedom plus irrelevant operators, it makes a lot of sense to actually think that the impurity or the weight momentum degrading is communicated system is but through one of these operators themselves. And for instance, if you take the energy operator as the one that controls it, now you get something beautiful because the correlation function, the two-point function of energy is completely fixed by the symmetries. In a hydrodynamic theory, in particular, the imaginary part is controlled by the shear viscosity in this system. You get a universal response for the DC conductivity, which is controlled by the viscosity in the system. And if you now take another glorious result from holography, the fact that the viscosity is related to the entropy density, you get a very universal prediction that the resistivity should scale as the entropy density uh, in the system. Now this may sound like an a, a important issue, but that must mean that the entropy density scales linear in T as well. Otherwise, you can immediately put this guy to the trash can. And indeed, you can, comp comp you can measure the entropy density through the specific heat in a strange metal. And here's an example where you indeed show that the entropy density scales linearly in the temperature. So this is now an, a proposal for the very universal behavior of this linear resistivity in the system. Not only the universal behavior, the fact that it extends over such an enormous temperature range is also far more naturally explained if you have a universal feature that doesn't depend sensitively on the details of the system, rather than a more, um, uh, well, detailed mechanism that would explain this resistivity. Now, this is not just an interesting idea, the fact that the momentum degradation is controlled by a conserved current. This is precisely what happens in graphene, where some of you may know there were a very nice set of experiments that showed indeed that there is a regime where the electron response in graphene acts like uh, a liquid rather more than a single particle physics. So this very idea has already been seen in experiments, not in strange metals, but in another system. So you can now wonder, can you really see this in real experiments. Well, there are two important, again, predictions that immediately follow from this idea. One is, if you look at this, this is this linear resistivity at optimal doping. You can, in various systems, try to suppress it by high magnetic fields. And you can try to see what happens at very, very low temperature in the systems. Because, precisely, if this is proportional to the entropy density in the system, and you believe that the third law holds, that there's no ground state entropy in the system, this also predicts that the resistivity should go precisely through zero at zero temperature. And this is some of the most recent accurate measurements. This is only from last year, where they tried to see what happens. Uh, this was a very precise measurement. And if you indeed extrapolate this curve all the way to zero temperature, it appears to go through T is zero to very high precision. Right? Far be be the, the, to all experimental accuracy, it literally goes to zero in these systems. So this seems to correlate precisely with this idea that there's this very universal system going. But it gets even more interesting. Remember, I gave you this, very uh, this, this, this data that the entropy density has to scale as temperature as well. That's precisely because now you have slaved the uh, electronic response to the heat response in the system. In a very recent uh, experiment that was just put on the archive 
two months ago, people, uh, the group of Thai Fair looked very closely at the linear resistivity as a function of doping in a very system. And you see a beautiful linear resistivity, but if you look carefully, in fact, the slope of this linear resistivity changes. But if the linear resistivity is proportional to the uh, <coughs> temperature uh, in the system, as the slope of the linear resistivity is then proportional to the specific heat in this system. And that should mean that the entropy should also have the sensitivity on doping if the slope changes as a function of doping. And that is exactly what is seen in an experiment. It's phrased in some uh, strange units where people try to apply sort of ordinary uh, single particle condensed matter theory, but this is really, if you read the, uh, the, the article, in fact, it is actually just a recharacterization of the specific heat. That was also the object that was measured in this system. And you beautifully see that they have at least the same qualitative behavior as a function of doping in the system. Again, this is a remarkable signal that seems to come out of this very simple insight that directly follows from a lot of the holographic computations that we've done. Um, and you, you see it in experiments. So this is one of the things that, uh, this is very recent data. Um, we hope that there's much more data that comes about that can verify some of these results. So these are some of the, the, the more exciting things. Uh, there are other things, other groups that have also looked to other responses in these high TC superconductors. And one of the responses is just the density density, the charge density, charge density response as a function of frequency and momentum. This is called the plasmon response. Uh, the plasmon response is, is the following thing. It's just the, the uh, as, as some of you may know very well, uh, this has a characteristic feature that at zero momentum, this characterized has a zero sound response, significant feature of metals. And then as you go higher in frequency, you see the particle hole excitations in the system. And the plasmon is nothing else the fact that this is actually the U1 charge density in the system. But of course, in real life, U1 is gauged, so there are Coulomb interactions between the system, and that lifts the zero sound response to a plasmon response where the gap, or the mass of the plasmon is set by the coupling constant in the system. And you can measure this object by very carefully measuring the dielectric response in the system. Now, it turns out that this is actually not so easy to measure these dielectric responses in the system, so a new technique had to be developed in, um, to measure this. And what they saw was very interesting because what they saw is if you look at an ordinary Fermi liquid theory where you have this beautiful zero sound peak that dies off the moment you hit the zero particle continuum, they saw something very different. They saw a very broad sound peak. This is, this is actually the remnant of the sound peak, which uh, disappears very quickly. This is in the, um, uh, the, the actual plasmon response. But if you look at the, the density density correlator, it looks like all of this has disappeared completely. This is very, very mysterious. You can try to see whether a holographic system can respond to this because one of the early successes of holography was indeed the fact that these holographic systems have zero sound in their collective response. And there have been many follow-up works. Uh, here is a, a sample computation. And now you can scan your <laughs> arena of hyperscaling Lifshitz quantum critical strange metal backgrounds to see if you can find this responses. It's rather hard because as I said the sound here is very, very broad. In principle, this is exactly what you expect. Remember, one of the features of the quantum critical sector is that all these line widths should be broadened. So far, we have not succeeded yet. The sound is always still too strong, but we hope to report on this more in the future. So here's a whole plethora of ideas that uh, have uh, both been experimentally revisited and seem to agree very well with some of the holographic qualitative responses. And you can really now try to push, and that's sort of the theoretical aspect of this group of collaborations uh, that we started up last year ago to, to get all the features that you see in strange metals from holography. Now, there are some, some of them we know very well. You need to have a D-wave superconductor. Some are less known outside of the community. There's a very characteristic response um, on the Fermi, uh, from, in, the, in the Fermi's single uh, fermion spectral function that is uh, correlated with the lattice called the nodal and antinodal decomena. Dichotomy, 
You want all the phenomena in the same model, the scaling of the optical con conductivity. There's a interesting aspect of high TC superconductor conductors called Ohm's law. All the scaling has to be correlated. As I said, there's lots of power law responses, but of course they all these powers are not completely independent. There's a nice work by uh, Andreas Karch and Sean Hartnell that tried to do this a couple of years ago. And then another thing that you should not forget is that this strange metal does not exist on its own, right? There are various phases that are adjacent to it. Of course, these are less universal, but some or another, uh, you should understand the phase transitions to these less universal regions as well. So in a, in, a, in a very early days, we already looked at the way superconductivity develops. So you're still in the strange metal region, but you approach the superconducting resonance. This is measured by the order parameter susceptibility in the system. And here also, you immediately get two interesting new features. Because you may emerge from this critical state, you can have a non-canonical scaling dimension in this system. And that you should also see in the response functions. And there's a specific experiment which, which based on the proximity effect in superconductors that you can design. It has been done for ordinary superconductors, but has not yet been done for high TC superconductors. But you can also look at the transition to the one of the other more mysterious aspects of the high TC superconductors, the so-called pseudo-gap phase. As you see, there are many, many physics phenomena that happens here. So uh, it, this is a difficult address. But one of the, the other features is that the, the pseudo gap emerges out of an antiferromagnetic phase, or more specifically, a mod insulator. Now, Jan Zanen will give you a whole story about some of the results that we've been able to uh, address uh, in this. The way you should think about a mod insulator in these more generic theories, it's really just a charge density wave which is pinned to the underlying lattice. Now, if I have a charge density wave, so I have some finite amount of density, it's a spontaneous symmetry breaking system. There is a zero mode or Goldstone mode in this system, which is related to the spontaneous breaking of momentum. But if you pin it to an underlying lattice, you should see the Goldstone mode lift. So that's really what you see in this system. But the more interesting aspect is that in these systems, the, the charge density wave is naturally intertwined with another order, which is best characterized as loop current order. And for some of you who have made set in a condensed matter talk over the last 10 years, you may have heard of a proposal by Varma that proposed that you can think of the, 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 the actual phase transition that controls this strange metallic region is a spontaneous condensation of loop currents inside the Brillouin zone. So there are, there, are, there are spontaneous currents that uh, order themselves, and this is the phenomena that controls the uh, strange metallic uh, universality. And indeed, if you actually do this in these systems, this intertwinement of loop current order, this is the pattern of currents that you get in a two-dimensional system where you see precisely these type of currents appear. And I really would prefer, like to refer you to Jan's talk later this week who will explain all the details of what's going on. I want to mention one more thing because this is part of my main story. Remember, the crucial aspect of the qualitative aspect is that you have these two sectors in the system that survive at low energies. If you look at this mod metal to insulator, the mod state is in mod insulator, it turns out that it's not such a great insulator after all. There's always a finite resistivity in this system. And that's actually very strange because really what should happen once, you, once all the uh, electronic uh, electrons are, are pinned in, your, in, the, uh, in the mod state, there should be no, uh, there should be an infinite resistivity in the system. But this is precisely what you expect based on holography. Right? In holography, there is this other quantum critical sector which remains, and so there is always a finite resistivity in this sector. It's just, again, uh, an uh, immediate uh, consequence of the fact that holography is a Lifshitz quantum critical theory reported by an ordered state. So I've, I've run th through you through a series of recent experiments that really, from scaling in ARPES line widths up to this mild insulator transition in mod states, that really all at a qualitative level seem to agree remarkably with what holography predicts. And I want to emphasize a little bit that some of these experiments could have killed the project outright. Okay? So, so far there's been a sequence of experiments that have not done so. In fact, they more and more seem to support this idea that what is going on. And so that is what really makes it exciting. So many of these results follow from this theory of a strange metal, which is this statement that the strange metal is a state of matter consisting of two sectors one of which is the quantum critical state. 
That's the novel IR fixed point from holography. And the way you can actually compute these responses, also holography is really the framework to do it, particularly if they're in the sector where there are no quasi particles. So I really hope to have convinced you that the new road to an old dream is very much alive, even more so now 20 years. And we really hope that we can see that we can apply string theory to explain experiment with holography. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Kunrad, for this really, really nice overview. I like this very much. And uh, so we have time for a few questions. Uh, unfortunately, um, we have people organized to run around with microphones, but uh, this morning the microphones decided not to work anymore. <laughs> so we have to uh, work uh, without them for now. I think we will fix this by the next ses session. But uh, so please do ask questions and please speak up and loud and clearly and, and maybe I can ask Skuna uh, to repeat the questions. I'll repeat the question. Yeah, sorry about this. So, so who would like to ask a question? Yes, so, so uh, the, the question is, if you assume that the resistivity is proportional to the entropy density, and then the entropy density scales linear in the temperature, well, th th this is model dependent, right? So if I go all the way back to the generic Lifshitz black hole, so the entropy of the black hole depends on various parameters in the system. So you have to find a holographic system where this indeed scales linearly with the temperature. So the, these, are, these are found, uh, they're, they're actually uh, models that were found by Steve Gobser uh, in the first case. And, and so when I mentioned this, this feature here, right? This is preci precisely, you can, you can find this in a specific model, right? It's not automatic that the temperature scales as the temperature. But in strange metals, it also does, right? And that's uh, for this mechanism to work, that had to be the case. Chris. Yeah. Uh, so in, in these experimental measurements where they determine the entropy is linear with the temperature, that's presumably a kind of gross measurement of the whole system. Actually, what you measure is you measure the specific heat, and then you integrate the specific heat to get the, uh, to get the um, uh, the include contributions to the, the specific heat measures everything. In, in terms of your computation. Actually, so that's not a, I, 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 I answered too quickly. This is the, the electronic specific heat. It's the contribution to the specific heat from the electrons alone. So you have to do, you have to do some uh, exercises to extract that. And that's uh, a part that uh, I would have to ask my experimental colleagues to explain to you in detail, but it is a crucial part. Uh, so there are some interpretive aspects of this data. So there was a question by... Yes. Since this is an overview talk, I wanted to ask about a material that was discovered recently, this uh, double layer of graphene that becomes superconducting if the two layers are twisted with respect to each other. It's a magic angle. Is there a... If, if, if you guys haven't heard of this, it's pretty cool. I was wondering if, if there's any, any group kind of working on this. Did you... Do you know about this? Yeah. Is there any group Um, I, I am not aware of it, but I see Jan Zane, the uh, job. Yes. Uh, is there a no limit to the time view? Like when you are in a certain limit? Is there a? Is there a lower limit from experiments? Is there a lower limit from, uh, from experiments? Because there are three. No, there, there's only one experiment. 
Um, where is it? There's only one experiment that we know so far that has tried to measure it. That's this, uh, and, and they didn't even know they were measuring it. So th this, is, uh, this is what they have seen. There's no other experiment that has come even close. So this is what we're trying to, or our, our experimental colleagues are trying to reproduce. Um, a negative new sounds very uh, so. So in the simplest SYK models, just for the same dimensional scaling, you get a marginal Fermi liquid-like response. It's pure dimensionality. You can you can change SYK and also get three exponents here. But th this you should understand. Let me emphasize this. SYK is in some ways another. That's actually one of the big advertising hallmarks. SYK is a microscopic model which uh, falls in the class of holography. So all features of SYK, you should be able to build a more general black hole that has all these features, okay? SYK just gives you specific values for some of these exponents. Renee. So you, at the end, you have this very long list of papers. At optimal dosing, or at their scaling behaviors, all consistent with one set of scaling points, like for example, most here. So as far as I know, the answer is no. Right, and uh, it, it, yes, it turns out that it's very hard to get them all to agree. Sean Hartnell and Andreas Karcher came close, but they couldn't match the specific heat. Um, so uh, this is still an open question. Yeah. So about your uh, two-series or component. Yeah. I'm not sure I understood the question. Can you repeat the question, please? And uh, two density, T and T squared. Yes. T is a bigger than T squared only in low temperature. Yes. But then actually, experiments show that the higher temperature is actually in power of the uh, T squared. So, what is in your explanation? So, what happens in, uh, I think you're referring to th this simple idea here. Yeah, so naively, indeed, at, if, if there is a component to the resistivity that is also T squared behavior, then at later times this should dominate, okay? So there are two things going on. One is, indeed, if this is a critical theory, right, there should be a, a single power law response. So there cannot be a T squared component. So that's why it is allowed to persist to high temperatures. Although, as you see in Kelvin, this doesn't go very high. But eventually, of course, even if this is a critical theory, you, you find that there are uh, irrelevant operators that kick in, right? This, this, this fan doesn't go on forever. So indeed, eventually, you find out that most critical points that you find in the data, indeed, uh, order 10 Kelvin, the, this fan stops, right? The one of the interesting part about strange metals is that if this is really is this quantum critical response, that this 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 quantum critical region extends to such high temperatures. Uh, yeah. All right. I th thanks for your many questions. I think we have the time is ready to move on. <laughs> but I would like to thank Kunal uh, again for his extremely nice overview and thank you very much indeed again. Thank you.